Hi, welcome to River Reflections. This is a program brought to you by Grand Rapids River of Life Ministries, where you are welcome to visit or even join if you do not have a church home. We would love to have you. We promise you that we will be hospitable and kind. And if we slip up and for a moment we're not kind, we will instantly apologize. <laughs> No, seriously, we work on relationships with God and with each other at our church. And we meet on Sabbath every Saturday. We have a 9.30 service and 11 o'clock service with a pot blessing brunch in between. So once you're no longer a visitor, which means about three visits, then we expect you to join in with bringing brunch items. And we sit for a half hour and fellowship with each other. We really have a blessed time at our church church. God has blessed us tremendously and we'd love to have you come. Last week in the program I shared with you the beginnings of the ministry in Argentina that I was in a few weeks ago on a ministry trip. I made the distinction between a ministry trip and a mission trip. Actually I went there and ministered to churches, to groups, in a Bible college I already last week told of two of those instances, one being a women's, the first Saturday that I ministered, I got there on a Friday, on Saturday night, I ministered at the Tabernacle in Chaco Resistencia, and it was to a room full of women who were either leaders or pastors in their church. Then I shared that the next morning I ministered in Porto Velelas, a church that the, my host, the Nesnecos, started over 30 years ago. Just a precious church where people obviously pray regularly because you can sense it when you walk in the door. A beautiful place of worship, dance, love, just a sweet, precious place where the Lord used me to speak a word into the church and into some individual lives as well as to pray for some people after the service. So that brings me to that Sunday night. I've got you through the Saturday night and then the Sunday morning and then the Sunday night while I was there I went to, I've got my pages out of order, isn't that terrible? I went to the church in Chaco called the Tabernacle, also pastored by um, Basilio and Esther Nesnaco, although at this point they have um, handed over a lot of the reins of leadership to their daughter Liliana and son-in-law Ariel and are grooming them more and more to be the pastors at that church because uh, they more and more have pastors all over Argentina who have asked them to be dad and mom to them and to their churches. So they're spending quite a bit of time going to other churches to minister as well as ministering uh, in the United States. Um, Esther, as a matter of fact, went to Africa last year, something I did not know until they just told me in this trip to Argentina. Both of them, both together and separately, are doing a lot of um, apostolic work and international ministry work. I'm so happy for them. They're both 65 just like I am and the Lord is starting fresh new vistas for them. It just gives me uh, hope for the fun of the adventure of ministering because God constantly surprises us with brand new doors being open. So that Sunday night I went to the tabernacle. Now here is a picture of that particular church and actually that particular meeting when I ministered to the tabernacle that night and again I prophesied to many people within that particular service you know I think of the fact that we used to have a lady named Linda Sutter come to our church and I personally was guilty of uh, yeah I'd listen to her messages but I couldn't wait until she was done so she could get to the part where she'd prophesy to people because that was something unique. Not everybody who comes by will prophesy. So I am happy that the Lord has gifted me with that same gift and that I can refresh the people I go to 
with that kind of a thing. Then, and I don't have a picture of this, but it's the same room. They had their cell group leaders, um, and all their leadership, as a matter of fact, their praise worship leaders, their cell group leaders, uh, all four pastors, come to a meeting that Monday night. That's what I did that Monday night, and they wanted me to minister to their leadership. Well, I happen to be the one that in our church that has trained all of our leadership that exists right now, as well as when we do have leadership meetings in church, I pretty much am the one to draw up the agenda and lead it. Now, as I told you, my husband, you know from the programs, my husband and I are co-pastors, so anytime the people in the leadership meetings can tell you this, if Robert, even if it's not on the agenda, if there's something Robert wants to discuss, I will defer to him to do whatever he wants to do in the meeting. But I basically, if he's not all excited about some topic he wants to get into, I basically handle them. My point being, after all these decades of training leadership and doing that, I, God has given me something to offer going into other churches to minister to either the leadership directly or even as I said in the last program, to go into the home of a fellow pastor who maybe is just starting out or maybe just six or seven years into their ministry, and they're wondering about communication and training of leadership. Well, I'll tell you what, anybody that's been, I don't know if we've got anybody that's, I don't think we do, that's been on the board from practically day one until now, but the people that are on right now have been on a long, long time and some of them can testify to what we went through in order to get some open communication with one another and not sit in a board meeting like everybody's scared to talk, everybody's scared to share something that needs fixing. Every, you know, It almost reminded me for a few years there, now we're talking 10, 14, 17 years ago, we went through a period of time, it felt like we were the uh, management CEOs of a company <coughs> and everybody else was union workers trying to protect everybody from management. It was just really a strange dynamic and uh, very difficult for me to work through when I really wanted uh, good relationships that were willing to speak the truth and love to each other. Well, one thing that helped us begin to communicate more as I instituted among the associate pastor ministers uh, the deacons still don't fill out this form but the pastors do and the ministers um, fill out a form every single month uh, that pretty much tell and I have them send it to each other and me in a mass email and it cuts down on all that uh, we know this, but we're going to keep it a secret. I'm ministering to so-and-so about what they're going through, but it's a secret. We pretty much have it now that in the church, if this one uh, is ministering over there to this person, that they know, the person being ministered to knows that Robert and I are going to be told about something serious as well. And that has cut down so much confusion. Well, the point I'm getting to is in this particular meeting of the leaders of this church, I chose to take the form that I have our, our people fill out every month, and they've been doing it for, man, well over a decade, and share just about every category so as to let the people know, look, your pastor is accountable to the Lord for the sheep in this local church. They've let you be cell group leaders and you don't have your own little kingdom where you find all, all, all this stuff and they say, but don't tell the pastors. No, your ears and eyes for the pastors as they know the state of their flock. You have to get beyond the snitch concept or the uh, draw disciples after yourself concept and into the we are a team we're all working to help the sheep here. And in order to do that, we have to be wide open. Another part on that, that list is, is there anything at River right now that concerns you that you want to talk to us about? Well, what that cuts down on is 
They're up here for several months at a time. Would you believe Robert and Rosemary are doing this? Da 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 da. But we don't even know that they're concerned. Nobody's telling us. They're just talking about among each other. And um, 13, 14 years ago, however long ago it was that we were going through that, people did that. And so what I wanted to do with this group is say, look, this would cut down on this. And I made it clear, your pastors may or may not use this tool, but at least you've been informed about the kinds of things <coughs> you need to be, pray about sharing so that no little cell group becomes a church of its own, but it's all a part of the whole. Well, again, the pastors really appreciated that, got some ideas from that. Like I said, I'm going as a minister who's been doing this for over 30 years, and these two haven't even been married for, I don't know, seven years, and yet they're just embarking on pastoring the tabernacle, and they need many Many things we learned the hard way. I'm hoping to help new pastors uh, learn before they even have to go through the hard stuff. So that was that particular night. Now I'm going to show you a picture of, <coughs> well, let me tell you first about on Tuesday, we went to a brother's restaurant from the Tabernacle. And what was interesting there is that in the middle of the food and everything else, the son comes, he's like 16, 17 years old, and Ariel, Liliana's husband, my translator's husband, they are the pastors of the tabernacle for all practical purposes, said, do you have a word for him? And here we are at the restaurant. And I'm thinking, oh, man, they're really making a demand on this. And by the way, I don't think that's the best practice in the world, that if you know somebody's prophetic, to just make a demand on their gift anywhere, anytime. <coughs> but I will not give a word unless I get one, and I don't make something up. I just wait, pray, see if something bubbles up, and then give that, which I did, which is really cool to be in a restaurant and, and have a young man be as blessed as he was. Um, so what I want to say to you, too, is when you go on a ministry trip, if you don't have any experience to give, if you don't have any gift to give, you might want to ask the Lord, to begin to work in you things that you can give it up. I mean, that would be true for going across town to minister to some church. But how much more when your church is paying, you know, over a thousand for an air ticket, not to mention a couple of hotel nights and, and food, and by the time you're done, they're paying an awful lot of money for you to go somewhere and speak into situations. And if you're not ready for that yet, just get ready begin to make notes of things the Lord is teaching you as you're pastoring and what a church needs so that when you do go somewhere you actually have something to give that's not typical um, that they couldn't just learn from anybody you don't go just to be going is my point but anyway uh, boy that was fun to go to this church we did a lot of fellowship I'll show you another picture of it this I didn't even bring all my fellowship pictures, but here is one. Because a lot of the time in Argentina, people love to sit at the table a long time. We got some friends, Margaret, Margaret Emerson from Africa, the same way. Um, dinner time becomes a, a whole another level of fellowship, and we're talking long time. Well, the interesting thing about this couple, and I think it's about the third time I've been in their home, don't, don't go off the picture yet because I wanted to point. This lady right here, okay, you ever try to point at something when it's a backward vision like a mirror or something? The lady in the pink? She is a congresswoman for the state of Chaco. And the very morning that we had um, dinner right here, she had been debating for two hours concerning abortion. It's not legal yet in Argentina. And... She also, these also are a couple that when I was at the tabernacle on Sunday night, I had a word for them as well. Daniel, he's an architect, the one in the blue. What was interesting about being there that day, a long time, he used to sing in a secular group before he was safe, sing and play the guitar. A long time ago, something happened to his throat. He didn't think he could sing and play anymore. But he knew I liked to play the keyboard, and they had a keyboard in their living room, so we were going to sing a little bit. So we go in the living room at this house, 
we start playing the keyboard. Then he, on some inspiration, gets out his guitar. I didn't know Liliana. This is my translator and her husband right over here. That's Ariel. That's Liliana. And by the way, that's Esther, the lady whose house I'm staying in, in the corner by me. But anyway, Daniel over here in the blue, he unearths his guitar. Liliana picks it up. She started tuning it, and she started playing along and singing with me while I was playing the keyboard. Daniel got this spurt of inspiration to pick up his, take the guitar from Liliana, picked it up, started to play it, and started to sing. He sounded just fine, and you could feel the thrill he had in realizing, I can do this. Clay Leah, his wife, the congresswoman, she was singing along too, so now... Liliana and Ariel are saying, because they just started going to their church. They've been friends for years, but they just started to go to the tabernacle. They said, you know what? We're going to put them on the praise team. Now, this is my thought. Here I am all the way from the United States. I'm going on and on how much I like to sing with people and play the keyboard. And then they decide to go in the living room. He decides to unearth his guitar. He finds out, wait a minute, my voice can handle this to a certain degree. What is my point? My point is, it gives them another way to plug in to their home church, all because of that little connection that occurred that day at that dinner time. You think that's small? I don't think so. When somebody loves to sing and you're part of a praise and worship team, it becomes a big deal, a big connecting factor. And times, if you love it, times you don't feel like going to church, you remember your part in the praise and worship team and you get yourself over there and by the time you're praising for a little while, your, your spirit has gone from dull to bright because that's what happens when you worship God. My point is, even at fellowship times like this around the table, sometimes wonderful ministry opportunities can come out of it. Nothing is wasted. You know, I think in the time that I've got left, rather than tell you what day what happened, I'll just go by the pictures I have left. And uh, I don't necessarily know then without looking at my notes what day it was, but I think this was around the next day. This right here was one of my favorite things that happened. This is Canzione Bible College. There's Liliana and there's me standing in front of the students. There's quite a bit more students in the back of this rather narrow, but quite a half again is long room filled with students. And one neat thing about this is it was filled with students from all over Argentina and Chile and Paraguay. I forgot where all else, but students, many pastors' kids learning ministry. And Liliana asked me to teach on a subject I don't hear anybody teach on, hardly. And that's a revelation God's given me on, because the law has been fulfilled in Christ, the righteousness of the law in, can be fulfilled in us as well, through the blood of the covenant in the New Testament, the New Covenant. And I had two hours <coughs> to break that whole thing down. And those young people were just a dream to teach to. Extremely attentive, some questions, some dialogue. Again, there's about six of them that are my Facebook friends now. And the dean of the college decided to sit in with us too, which was wonderful because afterwards we had this fantastic discussion, not only about what was taught, but then he brought up somebody that's from our town who has gone into deception. But he didn't know the guy's gone into deception. He hadn't even heard of the book that exposes the deception. All he knows is he had seen some YouTube clips, three minutes here, five minutes there, where the guy was, was sharing some really cool things. So he's like, woo, woo, I love that guy, which tells me that happened to me. I went to Zimbabwe, Africa one time. Same thing happened. Some of the people that we all knew to be going through some pretty shady moral times, they'd be on TV in Africa, but nobody bothered to tell them in Africa, you need to be careful with this person right now. But I had opportunity then to not only, all, not all, not only, I think of the word only, not always, 
not only tell the dean of the college that this person, you better be careful, you better be discerning, but then I got home, he had given me his, his email address, and I was able to send him several links he wants to keep in touch. You know what? I love that. When you're 65 and you got people in their 30s that take you seriously, respect what you're learning and you're teaching, and want to keep in touch and learn from you, it is a joy and as it's the joy of my life to train teach mentor and be in touch with people that minister to other people I absolutely love it and by the way I I went to Canseon College last year as well and taught there um, another night uh, one night we went to somebody's house for dinner and then uh, it was pastor and his wife but then the pastor heads the ladies in her church so she asked me to come and minister to these ladies i don't think they're all standing there there was two sides worth of ladies in this you see me in there somewhere da 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 there i am under my finger that's me my face and my body is always bigger than anybody's in the entire room it's really weird you ought to be me and try to buy clothes in argentina that's a joke anyway <laughs> i'd have to go online if i live there Anyway, these are the ladies in this church in downtown Resistencia. Let me tell you something. Now, I don't know if I can find this. You, you can't even see her. She's next to Liliana. But you, can't, you couldn't even see her. But there was this one lady in the church who, by the way, first of all, in this church, I did something I've never done before. I went into detail over several witnessing uh, situations in my life to testify about the many times God has come through for me financially. I don't mean me. I should be saying for river of life financially. There have been times we are trying to figure out what in the world are we going to do. And within a week or less, sometimes 24 hours of the need, God will come and meet that need. I Over and over and over. Well, I picked about four or five, if not six, instances of that to tell these ladies. I've never done that as a sermon before. Never, ever, ever. And one businesswoman came up to me afterwards. She was so discouraged, about ready to throw in the towel. And, and I kept saying, this is, you know, it's for everybody. But I said, this is especially for somebody in this group. And this one lady came up to me and said, it was me you were talking to. I was about ready to give up on your sermon. Just totally encouraged me. And now I'm ready to go on and trust God. And that blessed me. Everybody I could tell got something out of it. But I'm just saying, that particular woman. Now there was another lady. Um, it's usually, I don't always wait till I'm done speaking to prophesy. But often that's the way it goes. Sometimes it's right in the middle of something. I'll be, I like to wander. If I have a cordless mic, I wander through the group. I like to get in people's faces. I like to touch people. Some people love people love me doing that. Other people never show up again because I've done that. That's too bad. There's plenty of churches, though, where the pastor will be very, very far away on a very, very high pulpit. So there's plenty of places for those people to feel comfortable. But I, in particular, I mean, I will go into the aisle. It's, just, it's not something I do on purpose. It's just something I like to do. I just do it. Well, then if somebody catches my eye and the Lord drops a word in my spirit. I might prophesy during a sermon, but usually it's afterwards. Well, there was this one lady that she was an older woman, and I went over by her right away, first prophetic word after the sermon, and I said to her, you have suffered and suffered and suffered, but you are so full of the love of the Lord. Now, if you would have looked at this lady, your first impression would be just an ordinary, very, she was in her late 70s, I believe, um, just ordinary, looked like she'd had her share of poverty, um, hairstyle, dress, uh, not a whole lot of, she wasn't a fashionista, let's just put it like that. Nothing about her that would strike you as, wow, here's a living saint. But, when I went over into her space, I felt the presence of the Lord so strong, I just wanted to weep. It was just amazing. And she told me afterwards, she came up to me, and afterwards, they all sang happy birthday to her. It was her birthday that night. They had a birthday cake and 
hors d'oeuvres and things for her. And afterwards, she started telling me she had 10 children, and, and she gets up every morning to pray at 4.30 in the morning, every single morning. She was just the one lady, if I would have known about her ahead of time, I would have wanted to prophesy, is the one the Lord gave me an immediate word for right after the sermon. I was so grateful. But then I asked her to pray for me because I'm dealing with some health issues, and I really believe that that prayer touched me in a really special way. I just thank God for her. But that whole room was an unusual place. I feel that there's a lot of prayer in that room. But that's what I did that night. I spoke to that women's meeting. And then there was other ministry. But then I went to this ladies' meeting. That was the first I had met those pastors. And I'd already been in their home for dinner, too, that time. So it's the first time I met those two pastors from Resistentia. And then on, on the last Sunday night I was there, we were in like a three, three and a half hour drive to a place I probably, uh, if we were to pronounce it with English accent, it would be Villa Angela, Villa Angela, something like that. But it was a church named Shalom. Here is the church that we went to. And again, there was a lot of prophetic words, a lot of ministry went forth. I only have, this by the way, is the pastor and his wife. And one reason I'm doing that is because the man you see in the background, that's Basilio, and that's the first picture I've had. That's my host, him and Esther, husband and wife. But here I am with the pastors of Shalom. But one word I had there that just really blessed me later to find out how true it was, he, the pastor was singing and there was a point at which the Lord just said to me his singing was meant to break yokes and just the anointing, he needed to do it more, and that he was thinking the youth need to take over more so he was going to stop singing as much. Then after I gave him that word, two people come up to me, and te one man said you would not believe the healings and deliverances that have occurred during his singing, and his wife came up to me and said he had been saying he needed to let the youth sing more. So I was glad to be used by that. Thanks for listening to my story. It was fun telling you.